What is going on? Thanks for tuning in to the MMA podcast, talking a little bit of UFC 237, some fight announcements, upcoming UFC Rochester, Kevin Lee taking on Rafael Dos Anjos, uh, chilling here with my boy P Money on Twitter at Sweet Pappy Jones. Pat, how are you doing here? Oh, Big J, we are doing wonderful. It's a lovely May day. Oh my goodness. Got me feeling like Muhammad Ali in his heyday. I uh, very pumped up. We had a nice weekend of MMA from the smaller promotions to UFC. Got a nice weekend of some UFC coming up. Man, how you how you living over there? What do you think of this past weekend? Yeah, man, we had a spoil of riches. Not only were uh, the UFC putting on a card over in Rio de Janeiro, UFC 237, but we had Bellator 2. 21. Uh, what did you think of that one? You had Patricio Pitbull, KO Mike Chandler, one minute and one second in that right hand, uh, and the follow up ends Michael Chandler's reign. And now we have a champ champ at 145 and 155 over there. Uh, Pitbull looking good. You had uh, Jack, Jack Swagger, a, AKA, I think his real name is Jake Hayt. Hagar, Hagar, I don't know, uh, Jake, hey, how to pronounce his last name, but he gets a uh, little bit of a controversial submission squeezing in the choke a few seconds after the ref uh, patted him off his opponent. Uh, And there in the co-main event, another devastating finish to add to Douglas Lima's KO reel. This one against the undefeated Michael Venom Page. Who uh, who uh, who got chopped down with a leg kick, and then absolutely hammered with a uppercut that sent him to the moon, uh, erasing that zero off his re- record. Um, de- definitely still uh, still was his old self in defeat. He uh, didn't seem that rocked by it, but in the moment, it was a uh, incredible and devastating KO for Douglas Lima. Um, and he's uh, very familiar with KOing his opponent's leg. I mentioned, Pat, what did you make of that Bellator card before we get to Rio? Yeah, the Bellator card was uh, definitely a lot of fun. I'm uh, very pleased uh, Patricio Pitbull becoming the champ, champ, getting the 145 and 155 pound belts at Bellator. Uh, I've been a big fan of Patricio and Patricky ever since Bellator's inception. Uh, very well documented, my fanboyness of those two. Uh, very pleased for Patricio. Nice job, my man. Uh, glad to see him get that W. Solid, uh, legit, legit stoppage. Uh, some people say it was a little controversial. I think not. I think it was uh, it was good. And uh, love seeing Patricio get that W. As you mentioned, Lima um, getting the incredible finish over uh, Michael Venom Page. Uh, Michael had not really had many struggles in his MMA career to date, but and he was doing pretty good against Lima, but Lima with just that beautiful low kick to the kind of calf area, tripped him up, and then the uppercut as he, as he was trying to stand. Fantastic, just fantastic awareness by Douglas Lima. Great striking. Couldn't have been more perfectly timed. Great showing. Lots of great action throughout throughout the whole card. And then, yeah, heading over to Rio, the UFC. You know, they normally, I think, uh, split them up. They, we rare, rarely see the UFC and Bellator go head-to-head, but it was a difficult choice. I believe Aldo and Pitbull walked around the exact same time. So unless you were dealing with multiple screens, you had to make a choice there. Um, heading over to Rio for UFC 237 starting with the early UFC fight pass prelims. Uh, Vivian Arujo with a KO punch in the third round. Ronnie Barcelos, another bantamweight, uh, getting a TKO finish in the second round. And Luana Carolina defeating Priscilla Cachoeira via unanimous decision at the newfound women's 125 division. Anything stand out from those three fights for you, Pat? Oh, yeah, I would definitely say uh, Vivian Arujo's uh, KO over uh, Toledo Bernardo. Fantastic. Third round TKO or uh, KO, TKO, uh, women's bantamweight. Wow, one of the 
more legitimate KOs that I've ever seen with a big punch. Oh my goodness! If you uh, if you guys haven't seen that one, go pull up your Fight Pass subscription right now. First fight uh, at the beginning of the card. Great way to start it off. Big bang. Honey Barcelos following it up with the TKO Arvos over uh, Carlos Joaquin. Uh, Luana Carolina taking out Priscilla Cachoeira with the UT. Uh, good uh, good start to the early prelims uh, on uh, Fight Pass there. And then we moved into the ESPN prelims. Uh, a couple of UFC seasoned vets. Clay Guida stepping in against BJ Penn. Um, I have uh, aired my grievances about Penn fighting over and over and over now. I believe this sets a UFC record. Seven consecutive losses for Penn, who uh, takes a unanimous decision loss. 29-28, 29-28, 29-27 to the Carpenter Guida. Warley Alves, who himself has had a pretty up-and-down UFC career, steps in, gets an impressive third-round KO over Sergio Moraes. Tiago Moises, UFC newcomer against Kurt Hollibaugh, gets a one-sided unanimous decision. And Ryan Spann stepping in against the home crowd favorite, Little Nog, Antonio Rogerio Noguera. But it only takes him 127 seconds uh, that's two minutes and seven seconds for you mathematics majors out there uh, to knock out the legend, Little Nog. Will it be the last time we see him step in there? Uh, time will tell. He hasn't really been that active recently. But, uh, yeah, it was it was a fun ESPN prelim card. It was uh, sad to see Penn go down. But it was cool to see some new faces in the likes of Ryan Spann, Tiago Mo. Uh, Moises and uh, seeing those finishes op- was obviously a fun way to get the festivities uh, and the ball rolling there in Rio. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for me, it was definitely, and I'm sure for a lot of people, BJ Penn Clegg we fight was just tough. I mean, what body sanctions this fight to go on? Maybe that's why this fight happened in Brazil. Maybe no athletic commission in the States would sanction BJ Penn fighting anymore at this point. I kind of hope that's what it's come to because that was just one of the sadder things for me. I was, I was uh, very pained having to sit through that. Um, I'm glad it's over. Uh, Not surprised at all. Clay Guida was going to win. Clay Guida was a minus 700 favorite over BJ Penn going into that fight. I know I said that last week on last week's podcast, uh, I just had to reiterate that and how ludicrous it was. And, um, yeah, he got the victory. There, there's no need to see BJ fight anymore. Thank you, BJ, for being a two-division legend. Um, God bless. Someone get him on the analyst desk or something so he can stop cutting weight and hopefully start cashing some network checks or something like that. Uh, Warley Alves versus Sergio Marais. That was much more entertaining to me. Love that, too. Uh, guys in the prime of their their fighting careers, both uh, some Brazilian warriors, both have great uh, great arsenals, striking and submissions. Marais uh, probably a little bit more seasoned in the grappling, a little bit higher of, of pedigree in the grappling. Warley Alves did not care about that. It was a great, uh, fairly back and forth fight in all respects as far as the grappling and the striking. But Warley Alves in the third just pulled away. He put those hands together. Put uh, some nice combinations on Sergio Marais. Got a, a devastating knockout at the end of the third round. Uh, very nice performance there from uh, Mr. Alves. Tiago Moises, uh, as you mentioned, Jake, got a very sound decision over Kurt Hollibaugh. Uh Unanimous all the way around. Uh, good fight there. And uh, Ryan Spann versus Antonio Rogerio Noguera. Little nog, man. Oh, it was... Uh, no, no Gara for as short as the fight went. He did get some punches in there, but man, Span had the wing span in this fight. Much bigger at light heavyweight than Hosherio had a good reach on him. And uh, the ending sequence uh, put, I want to say he put a little straight on him, followed with an uppercut. Nice, uh, nice punches. Put him out clean. Great, uh, great victory for Ryan Span. And a uh, nice, uh, nice cap to the, 
uh, featured prelim card on the, or to the featured prelim on ESPN. Yeah, and then rolling into the main card, uh, the first two fights were very similar in that the uh, the hometown fighter was just overwhelmed by a fighter that was bringing more activity in the table in the form of Irene Aldala, Aldana and Loreno Staropoli. You know, uh, both both of these fighters went out and just worked them, worked uh, outworked their Brazilian opponent with a higher pace and the form of Irene Aldana versus Bitch Cohea. It was a late finish in the form of an arm bar, three minutes and 24 seconds into the third round. Cohea missing weight and having to give Aldana 30% of her purse. In the case of Staropoli versus Tiago Alves, it went all the way to the judge's decision where uh, it ended up being pretty one-sided to the UFC newcomer, the Argentinian, who I believe this was only his second UFC fight. Uh, both of those uh, fights pretty reminiscent of each other. Pat, any thoughts on those? Well, you know, Jake, as, as I'm looking over the main card, uh, what I'm really recalling is how wrong I was last week on, I want to say, just about every fight on, on the main card. <laughs> yeah, um, me too. I, I think, uh, yeah, I think I was, I was pretty much um, only one I got correct. Uh, we'll be getting to there. But, uh, yeah, definitely good performances from Aldana, uh, getting the sub over Betch Cohea. Uh, Betch, oh, my gosh, when I saw she got docked 30%, I was like – she better hope she wins because if you're going in there and you're only getting 70% of your expected purse, that's a rough day, especially when you're going in there and you're only getting basically half of that purse because you ain't getting that win bonus. And I doubt Bench Cohea has a uh, flat pay rate in her contract, but who knows? Maybe she does. If so, good for her. But, uh, yeah, tough. You miss weight, miss out on a lot of your paycheck, and then you get submitted in the third round. Uh, not a great night for Betch. Great night for Irene. Uh, Loriano Staropoli, great uh, great performance from him, getting it done over the vet, Tiago Alves. Um, yeah, definitely uh, the, the main card was, was full of action, started off, uh, started off strong and uh, did not let up. And, uh, yeah, we talked talk about picking those fights wrong. I took Aldo Silva and Namajunas. Uh, those did not end up working out. Alexander Volkanovsky stepping in against Jose Aldo, which seemed at the time like it could be a title eliminator match. We found out since that Frankie Edgar will be getting the next shot at Holloway, not Vol- Volkanovsky. We'll get into that a little later. But, uh, you know, Vol- Vol- Volkanovsky was doing an incredible job chaining jabs whether it would be a jab and a low kick a jab and a ripping hook to the body he was landing that jab consistently landing that lead leg kick consistently and it almost looked like what Aldo would do to a lot of his opponents back in the day just uh with a lot of strength you know we uh, saw Volk get the position with Aldo getting backed up and get uh versus the cage a ton it it um, Aldo definitely had his moments. I don't want to make this sound like it was just a complete ass whooping, but it deserved the decision. It got Volkanovski pretty obviously won the fight, and um, you know it doesn't look like he will be getting an immediate title shot, but he for sure is first in line after Frank Edgar. And uh, this this fight definitely puts a uh, puts all all he has done so so far in the UFC a big exclamation point on that big win for the New Zealander Volkanovski. Yeah, absolutely. And I uh, I picked Aldo in this one just a couple days ago. Was talking about how many guys Jose Aldo had beaten, just like Volkanovski. And boy, do I feel like an idiot today. Oh, my goodness. Uh, man, Volkanovski definitely, um, he got the job done, no question about it. Uh, unanimous decision over Jose Aldo. And that is something very, very few people can say that they've done, is to beat Jose Aldo um, at any weight class. Man, uh, and he's he's done it. He's taken out Chad Mendes, Darren Elkins, 
uh, Jose Aldo. He's just uh, kept taking out tougher and tougher competition, keeps stepping it up. And, man, he passed absolutely the most – one of the most legit tests you can find at 145 pounds. I mean, Jose Aldo, I consider him a pound-for-pound pound great, absolutely. Um, and still at the very top of the 145-pound division today. I don't think there's a lot of people that can truly hang with Jose today. Uh, so for Volkanovski to get it done the way he did, uh, the way he did very impressive. Aldo previously had been 10 and 0 in decisions, 10 and 1 after Saturday night. And it's funny, you know, when when we pick these fights, I said the same thing for the Volkanovski and the Cannoneer fights. I said initially, initially my gut, I thought, oh, obviously this is going to be a win for Volk Volkanovski and Cannoneer, but then I thought about it a little bit more. And I let the bias take over. I thought, oh, no, but it's Jose Aldo. Aldo is, a, you know, think about all these. Oh, it's Anderson Silva. Think, oh, but stylistically, Cannoneer's going to throw. And Anderson's a counter striker. And Anderson's going to get. And Aldo's going to win. It, that should teach you a lesson, boys and girls. Always go with your gut. Because in both of these, I initially had the right vibes on each. But then I let my brain kind of bias myself. Well, no, well, well, this and that. And I talked myself out of the right pick in both cases. Cannoneer, Ooh. I thought, would get counterstruck. But instead, you know, even you, you, you can, and, and the uh, result, which I guess I'll get to, was Cannoneer throwing an inside leg kick and uh, hurting Anderson's leg. I don't know. If we found out if it was a knee injury, an ACL tear, a broken leg, or what. Almost reminiscent of the Weidman fight, but in this case, it was Anderson receiving the kick instead of throwing it. Uh, Cannonier had been throwing the kick the whole night, so it wasn't like it looked like a fluke. That had been a part of his arsenal, and he had landed it a few times before uh, winning the fight via injuring Silva's Leg um, had had been landing, was winning the first round pretty decisively before getting that TKO victory over Silva. Was respectful to Silva afterwards, uh, was just rained upon with booze, and was pretty frustrated by it when the fight was over. Just 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 kind of standing there, making an angry pouty face at the crowd, be like, oh, "I respected you guys, but you didn't respect me." I mean, I you know, it's like. Yeah, I I get it, but what do you what do you expect? You just not you know you just injured Anderson Silva in Brazil in front of Rio. Like they're not the most mature crowd out there. Sorry, Rio. Uh, maybe I'll call you a little more mature when you stop chanting down at the fighters that they're faggots who are gonna die. <laughs> and that's not even me being. That's that is what they say. Um, so, uh, yeah, a little tangent, a little strange tangent about the Brazil crowds over there, but getting back to it, Jared Cannonier defeating Anderson Silva, Cannonier big step up for him in the middleweight division, uh, Anderson a bit of a step down, no pun intended, but, uh, yeah, a middleweight fight that ends in the first round. Pat, what did you make of it? Oh, yeah, Jared Cannonier, man, another one. And, and, Jake, I really like what you said, too, about trust in your gut. I can't say that, especially with MMA. Oh, my goodness. Same same thing here. There have been so many times where, you know, oh, earlier in the week, I'll, I'll have my picks done. I'll have my analysis. I'll do my first little just kind of off-the-cuff cursory picks just to lock them in. And every now and then I'll do a late last minute, you know what, actually, well, I was really thinking about this one. Rarely does that ever pay off. Most of the time it does not pay off. Most of the time you switch your pick to the wrong pick and you end up kicking yourself. Always got to go with your gut. It's just the best way. Um, unless you have a proven track record of your gut being wrong, but that's something you're going to have to figure out yourself. Uh, but be that as it may, Jared Cannonier versus Anderson Silva was kind of one of those fights for myself as well. But 
I mean, Anderson Silva, I think, well, I think maybe, maybe now, only now, after so many losses in a row, after the Weidman fight, can I start picking against him? Um, I mean, he's, he's been a legend in the sport. He's done so much, but that was many moons ago. Uh, Cannoneer, a uh, great prospect, former heavyweight, dropped down to light heavyweight, now down to middleweight, and looking pretty good. Got a, got a solid finish over... Uh, over Anderson Silva, a much quicker finish um, than Israel Adesanya. I mean, Adesanya couldn't even get a finish over Anderson Silva. That went to a decision. Uh, now, Anderson Silva did say post-fight that his knee was kind of banged up going into this one. So, nice little cop-out, nice little built-in excuse. Um, he can uh, he can have that. Uh, just kidding. I love Anderson Silva. But... Seriously, he did say that literally in the cage after that fight. So um, take that for what it's worth. Um, and he said the leg kick just uh, just got him right away. So short night in the office for uh, for both parties uh, going in the favor of Cannoneer. Uh, he's definitely uh, definitely looking uh, definitely looking for uh, some some good prospects at uh, at 185 pounds. It's only going to go up for here from him. And moving to the main event, a women's strawweight fight where Jessica Andrade takes the championship from Rose Namajunas via a KO slam. Only the 11th time we've seen that happen in the history of the UFC. Uh, Two minutes and 58 seconds into the second round. And this was a curious fight for so many reasons. The first of which being Rose Namajunas was winning this fight pretty convincingly. I mean, if if you pause the fight five seconds before the KO hap- happens and say who wins, be like, oh, Rose was kicking her ass. She was la- landing shots from the outside and uh, doing what it seemed to take to uh, maintain the distance. You know, she was implementing her uh, game plan for the most part. There was one spot previously where Jessica Andrade slammed Rose in a similar way that she did to end the fight, but um, Rose did not uh, obviously get knocked out that time, and she was able to uh, scramble away from it. But uh, yeah, it was uh, curious for that. It was curious because in the words of Kenny Florian, it wasn't Jessica Andrade who won the fight, it was Rose who lost it, like I min- like I uh, mentioned before. You know, there's there's a lot of times we've seen people get slammed in the way that Rose did. the The one that comes to mind for me was Daniel Cormier. I believe he did it to Josh Barnett and or Dan Hend- Henderson. And in both of those slams, which DC described this, I believe on the post fight show. The guy swings their arms out forward, and that allows their momentum to turn it into more of a roll so their head doesn't get spiked on the mat, whereas Rose was fighting for a Kimura lock, and had she let go of that, she would have been able to kind of roll out of it and not get spiked down. She held on to it, though, and, you know, I from the analysis of a couple other fighters that I've seen is that she should have known to not hold on to it after the first time where Jessica nearly was able to knock her out. She held on to it a second time. And for those thinking that this KO slam was just a fluke thing and Jessica was, you know, just going for a takedown and happened to kind of knock her out as a fluke, Jessica Andrade's nickname, Bate Azteca, literally translates to pile driver in Brazil. That's her her nickname. She had gone for the slam KO once before in the fight. She was going for it again. Um she uh you know she has that that kind of a skill set to get that, you know, rampage arona style slam KO and that's exactly what she did to get the belt in Rio Saturday night. Um, Rose making some interesting comments about retirement afterwards, and we'll see how serious they are as time plays out. But, Pat, what did you think of the fight? We get a new 
Brazilian champion crowned in Rio in uh, the pile driver, Jessica Andrade. Man, I thought it was an amazing fight. I couldn't help but feel a little bit bad for Rose Namajunas here. I mean, here she is coming back, dealing with the PTSD from the Conor McGregor bus incident situation. And she comes back. She's looking like she's in a good spot. Um, as you mentioned, she was she was winning that fight fairly handily. I mean, she was looking, I would say, as good against Jessica Andrade as Joanne and Jacek was when she defended her title against her. Um, that was a that was a masterful five round defense um, that Joanna was able to keep up the whole time. Unfortunately, Rose Namajunas she just uh, couldn't keep it up for the full twenty five and. Man, Andrade just powered through with the slam. I did probably the only correct pick that I made was going with a Vegas favorite in Jessica Andrade. But although actually I don't know what she ended up closing in, but neither here nor there. Uh, I thought she would get it done, but um, didn't expect it to happen quite in that fashion. Of course, that's why I say when it comes to MMA, if we're giving out betting tips, bet on the money line. I don't know how it's going to happen, but dang it. Uh, I, I had Jessica winning, and that's why you just take the name. Just pick him by the name. Um, but anyhow, yeah, great performance, Jessica. She is, I mean, she's a powerhouse of straw weight. Um, she does have the grappling. She does have uh, the, the hands. She has the power. Uh, Rose Namajunas, definitely a, a very tough test at 115 pounds to get through. I mean, tall, rangy, great strikes, great submissions. And, I mean, she was putting it. All over Jessica Andrade. It was definitely, uh, Jake, as you had mentioned, if you freeze frame that fight just a few seconds before that slam, I mean, that that looks like you're just going to get 15 more minutes of the same thing. It looks like it, it was very much uh, going to be Rose's night, but just did not go that way. Um, yeah, it'll be very interesting to see if Rose comes back. She had mentioned post-fight saying, she feels like she just wants to do something else with her life. And, I mean, after you get F5 uh, in front of a giant crowd like that, I can imagine you may be thinking about switching gears. Only a natural reaction. Um, let's see where she is uh, in, in a month or so and after all this, um, after things are able to, to get back to normal, hopefully. Just glad Rose is all right because that was definitely a, a very scary fall. Some of uh, or a, a very scary slam, anyhow. Glad she was uh, glad she was moving quickly. Glad she's um, going to be able to recover fully from that. Uh, but yeah, fantastic performance from Jessica. I mean, she she was uh, able to power through, um, get that get that gigantic knockout, and uh, bring uh, bring the belt back home to Brazil. It was uh, definitely very nice for uh, and a good way to send the Brazilian crowd home because oh man, they were, they were not having a good night prior to that. Yeah, and on Rose retiring or not, you know, it's it's not just the damage you take in a fight, but some pe- people seem to just be able to kind of uh, kind of put fight fighting away in a in in a box to where it do- doesn't really bother bother them. What's what's the word I'm l- l- looking for? Kind of not materialize it, but kind of compartmental. Yeah, yeah, they're 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 able to compart- like. Ben Ben Askren comes to to mind when he talks about fighting. He seems very relaxed, very casual. Doesn't really put that much behind it. When you see Thug Rose in like these these uh, UFC embeddeds, and they you know pan around her house, you see these like pieces of paper scotch tape to to the wall like you are the greatest. If you put your time and effort into it, you will be the best. Don't think about this, you know, it's all this mo- motivational stuff, which, you know, is inspiring and, you know, good for her and all that, but you you can tell. It's like something that kind of, when she has a fight coming up, it consumes her, and the emotions going into it, I'm sure, after a fight, you're not only spent physically from it, but after dumping all that emotion and all that thought for weeks and months building up to the fight, that in itself is something, you know, I think George St. Pierre also, 
disgust being consumed and obsessed about his 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 opponent and that was you know one one of the reasons that 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 he took a lot of time away from the sport so even if rose does take some time away i wouldn't want to see her return just because like we were saying she was beating the current champs but you know she was looking great against jessica andrage um she looked great in her two fights against Joanna and Jacek and just kind of selfishly as a fan I want to see more Doug Rose fights because uh, she is a hell of a straw weight as far as who's next to Andrade there you know I I I would personally like to see a rematch but there are other interesting opponents out there Um, Andrade has lost to Joanna and Jacek in the past so this could be a way for uh, the former champ, Yo Ioana, to uh, try and get the belt back. A lot of avenues there. Um, any uh, any uh, thoughts on who, who next for Andrade or any other random thoughts on UFC 237 before we uh, shift gears to the news? Yeah, that's going to be a really interesting one to see. Um, I think a lot of that definitely hinges on whether or not Rose is going to come back or if she does, if that's going to be anytime soon. Uh, I mean, there's definitely uh, some good prospects there. Tatiana Suarez, um, she is definitely, she's looking like a beast these days. Super strong grappling, great ground and pound. Um, I think she's going to be a big challenge at 115. She's certainly looking that way. Uh, Nina Ansaroff has a lot of momentum on her side too. Um, then again, Yoani and Jacek has a, uh, a victory over Jessica Andrade. So, I mean, Joanna, I'm sure she'd want that strawweight title of hers back. So, or the, the strawweight title that she held for so long. So there's certainly no shortage of opponents for Jessica. Um, you know, it sounds like Rose is probably going to take a little bit of time. Uh, and I, I want to say, if I'm not mistaken, I want to say Suarez and Ansarov are actually slated to fight each other. Um, I don't know if you can necessarily, um, if you could justify a title shot for Uni and Jacek uh, against Jessica Andrade, but then again, we know that hasn't stopped the UFC in the past. So, uh, yeah, no, no shortage of options there. I'd probably like to see uh, Suarez get it if uh, if she doesn't have a fight booked already. Yeah, that's another name over there at Strawweight. A lot of people are talking about the wrestler Tatiana Suarez, who has looked very impressive in her uh, march into the UFC. I guess moving on, you know, we last episode we talked about some uh, potential fights for Donald Cerrone, whether he should fight Conor McGregor, whether he should fight Justin Gaethje, whether he should fight Tony Ferguson. Literally, five minutes after we wrapped up, news came out about who he would be fighting, and it's going to be Donald Cerrone versus Tony Ferguson in less than a month, I think June 8th in Chicago. That's going to be a fun fight. Man, I'm going to be rooting for Do- Donald Cerrone, and Donald Cerrone has looked like a man possessed since having a kid. He's uh, looked great, but Tony Ferguson, man, there are not many people I'm picking against him. He has looked just incredible. I think he's on a, what, 12 or 13 fight win streak now, um, and as far as worrying about ring rust, there was none of that apparent in his fight against Pettis. My my heart is with a uh, cowboy in this one, but if I am honestly saying who I think wins, I'm leaning toward T. Ferg right now. I don't know. I'll look up the odds when uh, you give us your hot 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 takes on it. But um, you know, Ferg Ferguson has just been too much for all of his opponents recently. So I think I'm leaning that direction. What about you? Oh man, well, yeah, Ferguson has has definitely been a beast. I want to say I want to say he's on an eleven fight win streak. That's that's the number that's kind of standing out in my head right now. But I mean, he has he has torn through so much of the lightweight division. An eleven fight win streak that is insane. So few fighters have been able to accomplish anything like that, and he's been getting it done every which way. You know, dominant performances. Uh, And actually, I was going to say come from behind performances. I believe that's true, but actually not a whole lot of them. He's mostly just been mowing everybody down. Um, 
getting it done in, in brutal and, and terrifying fashion. I think if there's one person, though, who can give it back to El Kukui, it would be Donald Cerrone. Now, I think outwardly a lot of us would say Tony Ferguson seems like the more durable guy. Now, granted, Donald Cerrone also has been in the game longer. He's, I mean, he was fighting in the UFC when Tony Ferguson was on tough, if I'm not mistaken. So, I mean, he's got a lot more miles, a lot more years in the game. Um, But, you know, be that as it may, I, I don't think Cerrone's durability is as bad. You know, he's been painted as chinny. Um, or, you know, for a while there, it was, oh, Cerrone can't take a body shot, um, things along those lines. But, I mean, he seems to have been faring well against some pretty heavy hitters at 170 as well as 155 pounds. So, um, I'm actually, man, I'm really feeling like Tony, or I'm sorry, uh, Donald Cerrone could play spoiler to Tony Ferguson here. I mean, this this is going to be a tough one, um, tough one to pick. Uh, very going to be very fun to watch. I'm sure. Um, I think, I think Tony Ferguson is the smart play in this one, but man, I don't know. I'm for, for some reason I'm, I'm smelling an upset for daddy Cerrone, Jake. I wanted to do it. I wanted to have the balls, but I couldn't, you know, he's not that much of an underdog in Vegas plus plus one forty. T Ferg minus one seventy. Vegas thinks it's going to be pretty close too. They are leaning T Ferg, but uh, not by that much. Other interesting lines on that card: Tatiana Suarez minus six twenty five, big favorite over Nina and Saroff. Marlon Moraes, a small favorite over Henry Cejudo minus one twenty five over Cejudo's plus one hundred five. Valentina Shevchenko, a whopping minus eleven hundred in the title fight at women's flyweight against Jessica I. Um, other uh, other fights coming up, we got, like I uh, previewed a little while ago, Alexander Volkanovsky getting that big win in Rio, but he is not going to get the fight against Max Holloway next. That's going to go to Frankie Edgar, UFC 240, July 27th in Edmonton. And the big real story there is, did Volk Volkanovski get skipped over? Should it have, have been Frankie? And I think, you know, no, even if the answer to that is yes, and Volkanovski did deserve it, which, you know, if you you put a put an, a X over each guy's face, and I can't see who, who it is, and you say fi- fighter A beat Cub Swanson last year, Fighter B just beat Jose Aldo. Fighter A is one and three in his last four. Fighter B is four and zero. Oh. You say obviously Fighter B gets the shot next, and that would be Vol- Volk Volkanovski. But when we're talking about Frank Edgar, we're talking about a guy who has been skipped over maybe more times than I mean he's top three all time as far as getting skipped over. The man is known. For, he's he has just gotten skipped over so many times in his career that I can't really be that mad about him skipping someone else over because kar- karmically he deserves it. He is one of the all time greats. He is older. I don't think you know the the uh, time isn't as urgent for Volkanovski. Volkanovski will have his time in the sun, and Frankie Edgar never got a shot against Max. So I feel like it's fair. I don't have that much of a problem with it. Frankie Edgar is one of the can't can't not be in an exciting fight. So uh, I'll ride with this for UFC 240. And obviously I'm leaning Max because Max is a fucking beast. <laughs> yeah, agreed on most fronts there. Really, um, I mean, as you mentioned. Frank Yeager, 3-1 and one in his uh, last four fights. His only loss coming to Brian Ortega uh, in a fight he was doing pretty good in until he got caught with that Debo uppercut that just floored him. Uh, but that was a, a super short notice fight. Frank Yeager jumped in there literally to save this card. Um, it was a, a late last minute pullout. Um, 
I forget exactly um, what the issue was with there, but Frank Yeager literally jumped in to save that thing. Um, so I think this might be the UFC giving him a little bit of a uh, little bit of a payback. You know, uh, he scratched the UFC's back, so now they're scratching his kind of situation. And Frank Yeager, definitely a guy that has deserved it. Definitely a company man. Um, you know, besides that loss to Brian Ortega, his only loss and 145 pounds was a decision to, uh, or two decisions to Jose Aldo. And uh, so he's definitely, I mean, he's beaten just about everybody. One of the absolute best at 145 and 155 pounds. True champion. He's logged some of the most fight time in the entire game um, in the UFC, in the Octagon. Um, at age 37, definitely his time. I'm not too mad seeing this happen. This is definitely going to be a good fight, too. I mean, Frank Yeager, great technical boxing, uh, good grappling. Um, he's going to have a, a tough time overcoming that reach and that footwork of Max Holloway. But um, let's see if uh, the answer uh, has the answer. Ooh, you're going puns on top of puns on us in that <laughs> one. <laughs> um, another fight which they say confirmed. I don't... I try to avoid most Diaz rumors and announcements because they never pan out. Even when you had Diaz versus Dustin Poirier, it's definitely going to happen. Diaz pulls out. It's just they, they're, they're both so flaky. Apparently, the co-main event of UFC Am Anaheim in August is going to be Nate Diaz versus Anthony Pettis. Pettis going on Ariel yesterday saying, oh, he's ready. He's going to train real hard for this and... He's real stoked to beat Nate Diaz, and I hope we see the fight. Do I think we will? No. If it happens, I don't, you know, see which way I'm leaning toward this fight. This is kind of one I could see the wind blowing either way. I think right now maybe I'm going Pettis, but who knows. But both of these guys are killers if we see the fight. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll see if, you know, it's getting to be late July and the fight's still planned, then... Uh, Maybe I think it will happen, but for now, I am mad suspicious. But apparently, we're going to see Nate Diaz and Pettis in Anaheim in August. Thoughts? Yeah, allegedly is the is the operative word here. I mean, it's it's been announced. The UFC themselves have announced this as official news that Nate Diaz is actually back. Hopefully, that's the case. I'm thinking so. I wouldn't. I would not be surprised if that's the case. I don't know if the Diaz brothers pre-rolls are doing so good out here in the state of California. Uh, I mean, I sure hope that they are for their sake, but um, either way, you got to get some more capital to keep that business going. So uh, wouldn't be surprised if Nate Diaz actually makes his return this time. Uh, definitely great scrap. This uh, uh, could be a very winnable fight for him. Both Diaz and Pettis have similarities in the sense that eh, both have good striking, both have good grappling. Uh, the striking and grappling games are, are fairly different, though, with Diaz being more of a uh, of the Stockton slap boxing style and Pettis being more of a, a straight-up karate guy slash taekwondo, lots of crazy kicks, all that good stuff. Um, man, it's... It, uh, to me, it almost seems like both of these guys could be each other's kryptonite, although it's probably more so Pettis uh, being Diaz's kryptonite. They they don't fare well with the kickers, the Diaz brothers, and Pettis's, um, uh, Pettis's Achilles heel historically seems to have been the wrestlers with the pressure um, just smothering him for however long the fight goes. So I don't know. I think initially I'm leaning Pettis, but I'm a giant DS mark, so I'm, I'm always rooting for him. And then we got the, uh, we got the Magma Championship finally confirmed. UFC 241, August 17th, Yoel Romero versus Polo Costa. Uh, I'm leaning Romero here, uh, both guys. You'll, you'll probably notice that the world supply of uh, Magma will dip 
in the weeks lead, leading up to this fight, but don't don't worry, he'll return to normal levels when it's all said and done. Romero, a killer, and I think he, uh, you know, eventually the younger Costa will overtake him in this division, but I don't think that time has come yet. I'd love to see Romero take on uh, the winner of uh, this Whitaker versus Adesanya fight coming up. Even, even though he has lost to the Aussie champ a couple times, uh, both of those fights were very fun. I wouldn't mind seeing him run it back once more, uh, see if uh, the Cuban can finally put a belt around him. You know, he had those issues making weight. It'll be interesting to see if he will be able to uh, make weight easily against Costa, but we will see. Like I said, UFC 241, August 17th. I don't think he has much of a problem with Costa, but uh, hey, I've been wrong as shit many times before, right? Uh, what do you think, Pat? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, you and me both, Jake. That's what makes predicting MMA so freaking fun. But you you were very right. Uh, I I heard that almost all of the free testosterone and human growth hormone in the world will be concentrated uh, directly in the cage on August 17th when Paula Costa and Yoel Romero get to fight. Uh, it should be an amazing fight. I mean, both of these guys are just uh, amazingly built statuesque figures that, that seem to hit with all the power of a... Uh, a, a mechanical hitting machine. I mean, or what? A, a, a jackhammer, Jake? Am I? Well, I'm, I'm searching for something here. That's maybe like a jackhammer. Do they hit like? A, so who knows? It's incredible power. These guys. It's it's amazing. Um, like a locomotive. Like a like a yes, that's right. Like a like a automobile. Uh, it's it's. Uh, frightening their power, if I'm being honest. Some of these guys and their their strikes, old Paulo and uh, and Yoel. I mean, this could just be whoever lands first. I don't think neither of these guys could take too many shots from the either guy. Both both are just so jacked. Um, Yoel, I believe, is going to be a little bit smaller, maybe able to use that uh, lower center of gravity for some for some wrestling there. Um, I don't know something. I get this feeling about Paulo though, where he just uh, he's he's just got that nuclear magma flowing through his veins. I feel like he could just absolutely destroy anybody with one punch, and and I feel like uh, man, I don't know. I don't even want to say it. I feel like he's going to do it against Yoel. I don't I don't want to say it, Jake. But this is what I'm feeling. We were talking about going with our gut earlier, so I got to say it. This is, this is I got to say what I'm feeling. I think you I think Paulo. It's going to get it done. I, I mean, I'm rooting in my heart for Romero, but, man, Magma Championship is going to be explosive. You heard it here first, kids. Um, and I guess that we can change gears and get into the last topic of the night. This upcoming fight, May 18th, at the uh, wonderful Blue Cross Arena in amazing Rochester, New York. One of the... Uh, one of the most brilliant, star-studded, magnificent cities in America. I couldn't say a single bad thing about old Rochester, New York. Um, we have the co-main event where Neil Magny just actually dropped off saying he tested because uh, tested hot due to the banned substance dehydroxy, dihydroxy LGD4033. Doesn't know how it happened. Vicente Luque will now instead face Derek Krantz, meaning there will only be one fight I care that much about on the entire card. And that's RDA versus Kevin Lee, an interesting one. Lee, uh, the longtime lightweight fighting at 170, fighting RDA, who has two recent back-to-back -back losses against the two fighters who will probably be fighting next for the belt, Kamara Usman and Colby Covington taking on Kevin Lee, who himself is also 1-2 and two in his last three, losing fights to Tony Ferguson and Ally Quinta. Kevin Lee could very well win this fight. Odds are pretty close to even in Las Vegas, as they should be. But I'm leaning RDA in this one. I don't think Kevin Lee will be able to out-muscle. You know, they're not... He... Lee is not bigger than Dos Anjos, like Colby and Usman both are. 
I don't think Lee's going to be able to wrestle around RDA like those two men were able to. And RDA is 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 you know a really all all around fantastic striker from taking it to to the ground standing up. I think he's going to overwhelm Lee a little bit. Um who who knows though, you know, Lee uh you know, we've we've seen a lot of guys really blossom after moving up a weight class. I don't know how tough it was for Lee to make 155. He was a bigger lightweight though, so this move to welterweight could uh, be a big step in his career. Uh, we will see, you know, but both of these guys are, are top talents. So like I mentioned, I'm going with Dos Anjos in this one, but a win by either guy won't shock me because as it should be, odds are very even. Both of these guys have different tools they bring to the table. Just, uh, you know, I don't, when you look at a lot of Dos Anjos' losses, I don't think Lee will be able to implement the game plan a guy like a Kamaru Usman or a Colby Covington was able to. So I'm going with RDA. Pat, final uh, topic of the night. Who you got? RDA versus uh, Kevin Lee, the Motown Phenom. Phenom? Phenom. The, the Motown. The, the Phenom? 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 Uh, you know, Jake, I, as I look, uh, and as I look over this card, you know, definitely, yeah, not a whole lot stands out. Uh, Aspen Ladd over or versus Sajara Eubanks, though. Um, Aspen Ladd, bright prospect at women's bantamweight. Um, even even this main event, I mean, as you mentioned, you know, I look up and down this whole card. Main event, you got two guys who were one and two in their last two, and that's being generous. Rafael Dos Anjos, look, he's on a two fight losing streak. He's on a losing streak right now, and he's in the main card. Uh, Kevin Lee coming off a loss himself. Uh, in the fight against Ally Quinta in their rematch. And I'm not going to be, uh, I'm not going to mince words here. Neither of these guys have a lot of fans in this country, uh, at least to the best of my recollection. I don't know a lot of people that go around saying, yeah, Rafael Dos Anjos is my favorite fighter. Or, oh man, Kevin Lee, he brings it every time he steps into the Yo, Yao, Yao, Yao is a big nice. Lee fan. But yeah, shout out to Yao, Yao. Yeah. I think Yao, like, knows him personally. That's, like, his homie. So he's, like, got to shout him out. He's got a problem up. Um, if it was, It's, like, Yao and Kevin Lee's mom who are the only people who are fans of Kevin Lee. Damn. So it's it's a bleak situation right now um, for this card overall. Uh, but you know what? The For whatever reason, the more you look up and down a card and you're like, God, you just want to shit all over it, that's usually when it's going to be pretty good. You're so probably, right. It's just going to be – it's probably just going to be knockouts and submissions all night. It's probably going to be the Dacus card. Rafael Dos Anjos versus Kevin Lee is going to be a, a fight of the year candidate probably. Um, and I think – man, this fight I, – I feel like these guys – these guys really are close as far as style-wise. I think both definitely predominantly use their hands. Both um, have have pretty good hands as far as the striking goes. Both predominantly grapplers. Oh my gosh, I can't even. I have absolutely no clue how this one's going to go. This one has to be a coin flip on on uh, the lines. I would be very interested to see what that is. I don't have my best fight odds pulled up right now. Shout out to best fight odds, uh, your best MMA aggregate for betting lines. But um, yeah, this one has to be a coin flip. <sighs> I want to say Dos Anjos, but I don't know. Something's telling me Kevin Lee as well. Something tells ah. No, you know what? No, it's Dos Anjos. I'm going with Dos Anjos as well, Jake. Uh, very close fight. Wouldn't be surprised if Lee gets it done, but RDA all day this Saturday. Yeah, it's uh, – I'm – I am going back and forth on it myself, but I think I'm picking RDA as well. And we will see UFC Rochester coming up. Should be fun. I think the week after that, we got a week off of UFC, but then that fun Lionheart versus Gustafson card rolling up. A lot of exciting stuff on the way. We appreciate you tuning in. As always, we are on Twitter at the MMA Podcast. 
Pat is at Sweet Pappy Jones. And you got anything uh, anything else before we let him go? Oh, nothing but love for the people, Jake. Nothing but love for you. Always a pleasure. Can't wait for this Saturday. Love those scraps. We love those scraps. And we will be back next week. Until then, we love the shit out of you. We gone.